Hi, welcome to Highly Social. I'm your host, Mike Eaton. Uh, as always, we are brought to you by Golden Cricket. Try the new horchata protein powder, goldencricket.com. Use code Eaton for 10% off. We're also brought to you by Joker Designs. J-O-K-R Designs on Instagram. Go get the three-piece bong. You know you love it. Uh, and we are joined today by an extra special guest. It's Frank Castillo. Yo, what's up, man? Welcome. Good to be here. Uh, it's good to have you. Um, I uh, don't know if you remember when we met, but it was at a Young Goat show in West Covina at Bread and Barley. Yes, 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 yes. I think it was, um, what was the guy that was headlining? Oh, shit. It was, oh, what, the Steve Lee? Was right? it Steve Lee? Is He's the Asian guy that has some disabilities? Oh, no, no, he was on the show, but it was also, um, damn it, he was like, he popped on Reddit. It was like, he was a really good looking guy. He's on like, I think he's on a TV show now. Um, oh, oh, I man. can't remember, but yeah, he was the one who was headlining. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, but the, the, we met there, and I had I was eight months into comedy, mm -hmm. and I had just won this bullshit fake ass comedy tournament and gotten a manager, and it was just like I was so excited, and I'm telling my friends about it, and they're like all excited for me, and you're like, hey man, like that's really cool, but these people are so much more important than that guy will ever be. I was like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it just like ripped my mind open. It's so funny hearing stories about myself from like years ago because it's like when you're just in it, you're just kind of like, I don't know. I'm just repeating the shit that I've heard mm -hmm. millions of times from people that were older than me in comedy. So it's so fun when someone's just like, you said such a profound thing. And I was like, I was so high off my ass when I said that. Like, I was so fucking stoned. Well, you said if you ate first, you're last. I was yeah, like, yeah. Whoa. You're like, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. I think it's uh, I think a lot of that is just the store and like especially Rogan and all those guys like talking about like not only paying it forward, but also like teaching everyone before you because i don't know man everyone that was older than me and that was like headliners and stuff it's this weird thing of like the older generation of like oh you're gonna take my job or like oh i'm worried like i don't want you to outshine me or like mm -hmm. uh bury me or all this stuff where there's like certain headliners who are like i don't give a fuck about any of that i just want to see young comics succeed and get better yeah. where it's like as long as everyone gets better that only just makes the scene better and then you know uh high tide raises all ships that mm -hmm. was yeah yeah yeah, I, I mean, that's definitely true. It's uh, cool to see some of the guys that have moved here that have brought that energy with them. Because mm -hmm. uh, there is, there was a, definitely in a while that like crabs in a bucket mentality where it was like, there's only 25 spots and I'm not going to give you five of them. Yeah. You know, like those are my spots. And, and now that it's so abundant that people are really starting to do that and like work with each other. Like mm -hmm. We see it a lot in the roast community. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got a really strong roast community, and they're all we all like write with each other. Yeah, most, some some of the best friends and like family I've ever made is through roast. Most yeah. of the people that I battled have were at my wedding. That's so cool. it was just like you know, or in my wedding party. So it's like that's such a family thing, you know. Yeah, and it's funny that you say that about people that um like. Bogart spots or like gatekeeping stuff because those people that don't ever try to get better at comedy and only do that because they're like this is my scene this is my island mm -hmm. those people never get better and they just stay on that island mm -hmm. you know there's people that I started in LA with that were doing the exact same thing most of them either quit comedy or they're just like in the Facebook uh, you know comedy scene just talking shit and it's yeah. like well you're not doing anything still yeah. yeah, dude, Facebook comedians are awesome. It's the weirdest thing, dog. <laughs> it is the weirdest thing. You'll see people just like have such crazy high opinions, and you're like, you did five open mics yeah. and then joined a Facebook group. Like, you're not like any of us. It's, I, uh, I grew up very like Catholic and shame based. Mm. And so, like, the idea of like, uh, promote, like, self promotion feels so just icky. Yeah, it's very weird. And the way that some people are so just unashamed of the things that they're, I mean, they're live streaming on Facebook from an open mic with 20 people that are really not excited that comedy is happening. Oh, yeah. And they're just eating a bag of dicks, and they're like, this is what Carlin was talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, man, you don't have to show every, it's, it's, it was so funny to see the shift, too, because before, I remember talking to one of the talent coordinators, and his, like, uh, piece of advice was like get rid of everything you have online have like only one good thing because then people can see and then that changed within like a year especially with social media and you started seeing people just flood stuff and it's interesting because 
you're right in a sense where it's like you'll see people post stuff from open mics, but it'll be small clips, and people will see that, digest it, but those aren't like comedy fans. Those are like people who are just stumbling on a clip. And then if they do go see a show, it's usually the first time seeing comedy, and they're not like educated or well behaved comedy people. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why we've gotten so many more hecklers. Yeah. I, I, at first, I thought it was because people were inside so long that they just like were so contained. And like, I've always thought that at a certain chunk of every comedy audience are people that wish they could be comedians. Oh, absolutely. But feel like life has not made it possible for them. Yeah. So it's like a vicarious thing. But like, I really started noticing it a lot in 2020 and 2021 is people talking back at shows. Yeah. And like, really like, trying to make themselves part of it. Yeah. And it's like, I know some of that is the crowd work clip culture where yeah. people are like, I'm going to get famous from this. Which is so bananas to me. But I think what you're talking about too is like, they're just, they're not comedy fans. Mm -mm. They stumbled on a clip and ended up at the show. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, that's all they know. Yeah. It's the, weird. The crowd work stuff so weird to me too because you'll see it and it'll be like, uh, it'll just be them repeating what the person said. And then, like, they're like, ah, oh! and then, like, that'll be the clip. And it's like, well, you didn't do anything. You didn't really do anything. You didn't, like, there's no, like, amazing writing or any rift. You just repeated what they said. And also, most crowd work is all hacky because it's <laughs> all stuff you've heard before or, yeah. like, stuff you've reworked or seen someone else do. It's never insanely original. Like, there's only a few people who do, like, crazy original crowd work it's like todd barry ian bag um big rick j. ingram yeah big j like stuff like that those like people who know to talk oh, to people rick, Ing man. rick ingram's insane god i would love to watch him with an austin crowd oh yeah he would do great <laughs> but it's it's so funny because you'll see those you'll see i mean i call them real comedians but i spell it <laughs> R i spell it r-e-e-l uh <laughs> but you'll see them go and like you know it's this weird thing of when you become like a Sebastian, right, and you sell out everywhere and all the people are your fans, I remember he talked about he'll go to the store specifically or do those clubs because they're not all his fans. Mm -hmm. And he lugs it like that because he gets to get a good, honest judge of what his jokes are. Because if you're surrounded by people you love that love you, you can't fail, right? Yeah. There's not like – and like there's you can't do no wrong. So you see these guys and it's like they have all these songs. They're selling out shows. They're doing weekends. But it's like – well, now you're doing stand-up in front of people that love you. So building that or whatever that's going to be is a lot tougher. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, it's it, That's been always the thing I'll find a comedian. And this has been my whole life. Before I even started comedy, just as a fan, I'd find a comedian. I would listen to all of their stuff. And then their new album, now that they popped, would come out. And it would suck. I'm like, what happened? This is the same person. That, and it's the same sound and the cadence. But it's it's so watered down and boring. Yeah. And Some, then, then the one after that, you're like, oh, I don't even like them anymore. Like, what happened? This Someone had a good uh, thing where it was like, the business of comedy is making people who don't know who you are laugh. And I don't know, I can't remember what the exact quote is. But like, the talent of comedy is like making people who don't know who you are laugh. And the business of comedy is making people who know who you are laugh. Because mm. it's like, you know, there's people who don't know who any of us are. And it's like, that's where the fun is, is trying to make those guys laugh. Yeah. And there's people who know who you are and then they come on the journey and stuff. And that's good. But it's like, there gets to a point where it's like, if everyone knows you, everything's just harder. Yeah. That's, uh, that's such an interesting. I'm just starting to get to the place where people recognize me. And like, uh, it's not like people know me or my comedy, but they've seen me a couple times. Yeah. And they're like, Oh, you're very funny. It's, that feels so different. Yeah. Where it's like people are coming to shows because they've seen me before. And they're like, oh, we want to see you again. Yeah. It's like, whoa. Yeah. What? And if it's this weird, like, <laughs> what <laughs> pressure of being like, oh, okay, now I got to, like, write more. You know, there's people watching. You know, yeah. you're not unknown anymore. And it's like, oh, I wonder what jokes they saw me do. Mm -hmm. I better not do those tonight. Yep. I don't want them to think I'm some fucking one-trick pony mm -hmm. who just has this joke, you know? Yeah. That's... Uh, I also know that I'm not at a place where any of my material is necessarily like this isn't going to be like my great stuff. Of course not. I'm still just writing. It's fun to make it crush, and when it yeah. crushes, it does. But like, none of this is going to be like when I do my first real hour. None of this material is going to be in it the way it looks now. Yeah, you know, because I'll be so much better. That so it, there's a weird uh, feeling of like being very attached to the material and also knowing it doesn't matter at all. Yeah. Cause before you know it, you'll be five years in 10 years in, and then you're just like, Oh, 
uh, all those jokes were written by someone who was young in the comedy. Mm-hmm. As you get older, too, you'll start to see your jokes start to, not age, but the quality of the new stuff you start to put out. You're just like, oh, I've, I'm operating at a different level now. I'm, at a, I'm a different person, a different comic. Mm-hmm. I've got more tools. And then just the things become better. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I'll be five years in in like 10 days. That's wild. Yeah. Yeah. I just, but I look at, I mean, even the thing I recorded last year, people ask me like, oh, where can I watch your stuff online? I'm like, oh, I put out a half hour last year. Go check it out. And I go watch it. And I'm like, oh, 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 why were you that way? Yeah. <laughs> just imagine uh, those guys who put up open mic clips like 10 years from now and they look back and they're like, oh, my God. Dude, I did that. My, I, when I got arrested for my weed pen, when I was in jail, the cops had found out that I was a comedian. So they Googled me, and the thing that came up because it had the most views was my first open mic clip that I'd put on YouTube because for a year I'd used that to submit to shows. But it's it's just like a shitty – it's at Las Papusas in fucking Monrovia or something <laughs> The cop like gave that. you more time. You know I mean? and, and it's me like – talking about how much I love drugs and how cool <laughs> drugs are. And I'm just like in jail for drugs and I'm just bombing two cops. I was like, ah. Oh my God. <laughs> but even then I'm like, watch a newer one. I, I, I got better. Yeah, yeah, I promise. Yeah. Like, no, 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 no. <laughs> Go to my Instagram. I have a cool reel. Yeah, yeah. Check it out where I asked this guy what he does for a living. <laughs> I was like, you're a baker. What? <laughs> uh, so who, who are some of your favorite comedians? Uh, just in like in general or just like now or like starting out whatever comes to your mind um i think if i have to pick right now my favorite ones are, i mean simpson's always been like my favorite because i've watched them uh, and coming up with them uh fahim anwar is probably one of the best i think uh, underrated comics right now yeah um he's been crushing since i was like just starting comedy i could not believe that hat trick didn't just go Super viral. I know. I it's know. It's such a good. Special. I think a lot of that was because of uh, uh, just the. I think Fahim's material and everything he did was fanta- fantastic. I think the idea was really, really great too. I just think whoever uh, video shot it and didn't color correct it was. You know what I mean? There's a lot of things that it's like that. That should have been a lot bigger. I think. You yeah. Know? And it's like uh, just small things like that really matter. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, I think also like the the hat trick part of it that makes that so cool and special. That's a little more niche of a crowd. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also like it's like the concept of not knowing, like, if you don't know what the store is or how that works, yeah. Um, but, I mean, uh, Ray Romano did something kind of similar with um, his special. What was it? Uh, God. He walked across the street and did that. Yeah, he did all three. When uh, Schultz did 510 yeah. in 2019. Yeah, yeah. Where he did all the spots in New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, yeah, it's just like... Fahim's fucking incredible. It's phenomenal. He did a show here one time where he, ha- I was hosting, and he had me bring him up as Dylan Sprouse, a frat brother yeah. that had lost a bet and so had to try stand-up for the first time. And he did one of his accents and is doing... There, Maybe 10% of the crowd got how hilarious it was because they were brilliantly written terrible jokes yeah absolutely and it was just like it was impressive how bad he was at it but it was still fucking hilarious oh no awkward he commits dude oh man he uh he has a character called lance can't stop and i remember being a door <laughs> guy when it would happen and he'd come out and he would just dance and he would just dance do music and all of it was just improv he'd have people shout stuff from the back and then he'd like he'd just improv with it was like phenomenal and it got to a point where like you know uh you didn't know if it was going to be Fahim or Lance when he went up. And they like, it was like Batman. You'd see him there and he'd be like, all right, I'll be back. And then he'd run back and he'd come back and he'd have like the mullet and shit. It was just so ridiculous. I remember he had it in a bag too. So you're just like, it's like finding Batman's cape, you know, or his mask. Dude, he was ridiculous. That's so fucking cool. Yeah. The, the culture of the store during like that era of like the heyday of it. I mean, that had to have been crazy to be a part of. It was phenomenal, dude. It was like Rogan, Burt, Seguro, was all the big heads there. Um, phenomenal shows. Everything was selling out. Uh, I mean, yeah, it was definitely, uh, it was the, it was crazy to come up at that time and then to be passed by Adam as like, I think it was like the second to last class to get passed. And it was right before COVID. Mm-hmm. So it was, yeah, it was insane. Yeah. That's super fun. Cool. What's been like one of your favorite store memories? Oh, that's so tough. There's a lot of them. I mean, because- yeah. I loved the open mics and I loved how ridiculous they got because that, that truly is one of the funniest things. I think, all right, if, one, if I had to pick one of them, uh, potluck, uh, any, watching anyone follow El Tocho 
El, oh, do you know who El Tocho is? So El Tocho is the Mexican cook for the comedy store. And what they would do is they'd have the open mic. And in the middle of it, they'd put El Tocho up. And El Tocho didn't speak English. He just spoke Spanish. <laughs> Fuck yeah. He would go up and he'd put his like rubber gloves on because he cooked food in the back. Yeah. And then he'd do f- three minutes, but you didn't understand a single thing he said except for the word pussy. So he'd just be like... <laughs> He just be like, I love pussy and like, you know, a wet pussy, fat pussy. And it's just like the audience didn't know what the fuck was going on. Yeah. But by the end of it, they were just dying laughing because yeah. they're just like, this Mexican guy loves pussy. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's hilarious. <laughs> and um, and it was so fun to watch comics have to follow that because most of the time people could not follow him. And it was yeah. just so funny because I know it was like someone from Ohio who like spent like a lot of money to fly here to try to make it. This was like their chance. Yeah. And then they got to follow a Mexican cook talking about pussy and absolutely get buried. <laughs> it is like one of the greatest ones. Um, that is pretty awesome. I got a great Lucy K story. Um, okay. So I was, I'm bit Lucy K is one of my favorite comics in the world. Yeah. I love him. He's one of my, I all chewed up. Uh, was it hilarious? Yeah. Uh, was, Oh my God. Right. Yeah, and uh, fucking live at the comedy Li- store. Yeah, li- live at the comedy. I was there for that. That's I got to sick. see that. That was cool. So I've gotten to talk to him a few times because I worked the green room and stuff. And then yeah. um, all the new ones have been fucking incredible. Dude, I love him. Um, so he um, he watched the first roast battles because he also helped uh, someone. I think he was like helping one of the guys. Like he tossed him a few jokes. Um, but so he was there too because it was just for laughs. So he watched it all go down, and. Um, the second season, Todd Barry was in it. So I knew he was watching because Todd Barry's his guy. Mm-hmm. So it was all these things. And then um, I won. I was still working at the store like a little bit afterwards. And uh, he showed up. And I was like, oh, this is like I can finally like I can talk to him about this. Yeah, like yeah. this is like my end. So we're hanging out in the back. And uh, it's right by the parking lot. It's like Tony Hinchcliffe and a bunch of other comics. Louis C.K. walks up and then he's like, hey, I saw you on Rose Battle. He's talking to Tony. He's like, I saw you on Rose Battle. You're very, very funny. And then everyone starts talking about Rose Battle. And I'm like, oh, this is my this is my shot. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, uh, I was like, I was actually in season two and I won the whole thing. And he like looks at me and he goes, thanks, man. And then he walks to the car and I didn't know what happened. I was just like, wait, what? And then like everyone didn't, no one corrected him on what I said. He just misheard me. Yeah. He thought I was complimenting him on his season of Louis. Yeah. You know? And I was like, but no one corrected him. Everyone just like took a step back and just let me sit in it. And like he like left and I was just like, ah, like I felt like a fucking (laughs) idiot. And then Tony looks at me and he goes, hey man, it's fine. He was like, you'll probably see him tomorrow. You'll get him next time. The next day, the article drops. And I don't see that dude for a year's, like at least a year and a half, two years, Holy right? Shit. I run back into him at the uh, New York uh, Skank Fest, right? Uh-huh. And I see him in the green room and he comes up and he's, everyone's like, you know, stoked and stuff. And I like shake his hand. I was like, hey, my name's Frank. We met at the comedy store. And he goes, sorry if I don't remember you. It's been a while. <laughs> That's and I was awesome. like, fuck. And I felt like <laughs> such a dick again. Yeah. <laughs> That rules. Yeah. Dude, he uh he's one of my fucking heroes. I the year before I started comedy, I made it a point to go and see all of the people that I really liked and go and sit mm-hmm. in the front row. I had joined this charity, it was called the Front Row Foundation, where they take people with like cancer and shit and they put them in the front row of stuff. And I'd taken a lady to a Cowboys game and it was just like life changing. And I was like, oh, man, I should go and do that for myself. Yeah. You're yeah. like, thank God she's got cancer. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been here. Yeah, right? But I but I did all these shows, and then I had tickets to see Louie, and for whatever reason, uh, I kept having work stuff and things come up where I just couldn't see him. And then the article drops, and he gets canceled. And then it's like, I'm never going to get to see him again. And then I start comedy, and I didn't. it wasn't like a focus to go and buy tickets to shows unless it was like a once-in-a-lifetime thing. And even then, it's comedy. You don't have a bunch of extra money. Yeah. Uh, and then he was coming to uh, Austin to go on Rogan uh, to promote his movie with Joe. And, like, all of the things lined up, Joe List, instead of featuring for him, ended up having to go to uh, Mark Norman's bachelor party. So the first day he misses. So uh, the owner of the creek was like, hey, we're going to have you and Ariel open for Louie. Nice. It's like, what the fuck? I like was, I didn't get tickets to the show, so I was like, I, can I just like work like the dish pit or something just so I can watch? She's like, how about you open? Like, I, y- yeah, I'll do that. And then meeting him, 
he walks into the green room. Me and Ariel shake his hand. They start talking. Uh, and he goes, so how long have you guys been doing it? And I, you know, I just I always answer honestly. And I was like, like four and a half years. And he goes, and like it's, it's like shock. And Ariel goes, no, 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 he's good. And then he just did not want to talk to me for the rest <laughs> of the <time>. uh, <laughs> I should have lied. Uh, I should have lied. I remember, no, I remember, I remember when I met him at the store. I was working, and he he had asked me. He was he was like, how long have you been doing it? And I was like, oh, I was like, I think I said kind of like the same thing. I was like, oh, like. Th- Three and a half, four years at the time, and he was just like, "Whoa!" He's like, "Well, at least he's like, well, at least it's long enough to know that you're not going to quit." And I was like, "Well, that fucking feels good." Like, yeah, you know? it's it's interesting. Like when you're a young comic and you get small nuggets from these big guys, it really like it's shit like that that makes you keep doing it for a couple more years. Like I remember me and Jay were first doing roast battle. We both had to battle each other, and we were roommates at the time. And nice. I remember we both were like, "Let's not." do it to where you know it's like because we didn't care who won or lost Mm -hmm. so we were like let's write the jokes together Mm -hmm. and then we wrote the jokes together and i ended up writing him like the joke that he beat me with because it was just so good i was like i can't do this you got to do it yeah and uh it was great and then um we're there we're battling and then uh dave Chappelle shows up and it's like one of the first times he got to see the roast battle i think it was his first time seeing the roast battle that's so cool so it was me and jay and we both just looked at each other while we're on stage we're like holy fuck thank god we wrote (laughs) And I remember, like, we were just doing the jokes, and then seeing him laugh mm-hmm. was like, I was like, oh, I'm never going to fucking quit. Ever, I'm yeah. never, ever going to quit. Yeah. And then um, I had one joke that made him laugh so fucking hard, that's where he was like, he, he just remembered me from then on. And I was like, okay, cool. But it was, uh, I said, uh, Jay Light's so white, he forgets to cash his paychecks. <laughs> yeah. And he, like, thought it was the funniest thing I'd ever, and I was like, oh, that's so good. Um so that is a great roast too. Yeah. Is, uh, so this is uh, actually this is an, I guess this is another really f- favorite memory of mine at the comedy store. So it was uh, roast battle finals. I was battling Matthew Bouchard. Uh, it was Joe Dosh. I had to battle Joe Dosh and then the whoever won after that. So it ended up being Matthew Bouchard. But um, so I had written all these jokes. I had done all these shows. I was running them everywhere around town. And finally, I was just like, oh, I'm done. I'm good. Like, I have everything. I'm memorized back and front, forward and back. Like, I could recite every joke. Mm-hmm. I had everything down. And then um, I go to the store, and I'm sitting in the back of the bar at the store, and Chappelle's there. And I walk in, and he's just like, oh. He was like, I thought you'd be out, you know, running stuff. I was like, no, I'm good. I remember. He was like, I've, you know, I've, I have remember all my jokes. I'm, I'm set. And he was just like, oh, you're going to win. And I was like, what? And he was just like, yeah, you're going to win. He was like, there's, there's no doubt about it. And I was just like, oh, shit. That's and cool. I don't know That's if it, fucking cool. I don't know if it was hearing him say that that made me think, oh, I'm going to win. Because mm-hmm. after that, it was just like, well, he said it. It has to be true. <laughs> yeah, duh. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not, like, now I can't not, you know? Yeah. So I don't know if it was just everything being perfect and all the stuff and all the writing, everything I'd done leading up to that. Um, but it was just like, that was like the thing that sealed it for me yeah. in my head. I was like, Oh yeah, the guy, the goat said it. That's so fucking so cool. It has to be true. Yeah. And then it did. And I was just like, yeah, it was wild. Oh man, that yeah. rips. I got, uh, I did uh rose paddle for South by this mm-hmm. year and, uh, I'd written all my jokes and I, and I had them all prepared and I had, uh, a couple in my head, that I was waffling between for what I wanted to use to close. And in the middle of it, I just, in my head, I did my fifth joke fourth. So I did it, and then I'm struggling to remember what my fifth joke is. Ugh. And I'd like, and I'm just hitting a blank. And as I did that, Nick, the guy I was battling, dropped his best joke of the night, and I didn't even hear it, because I was so in my head. So I had no idea what he even said. And I'm like, oh, fuck, and I freeze. And I have to look at my phone to pull it out. And that's, I lost right there. But Todd Berry was one of the judges. Uh, and I always go back and forth with judges and roast them a little bit. Because uh, it's just fun. And it's always off the top. And so it gives me extra points always. And it got to Todd. Uh, and I said, I only watched Spicy Honey because I thought it was about food. And he was like, oh, that was, that was very nice. To, that was very nice to say that. Um, you lost. <laughs> oh my god but but then afterwards like uh, i felt just ashamed it's like i can't believe i just flopped on on my fucking fifth joke and like it just felt so bad and then everybody mike lawrence and all of them in the back were like dude your jokes were fucking great it was just you lost because you forgot and then we all piled on you but like don't take it personally hmm. you did awesome and it was like oh man 
that's nice. Yeah. So I was ready to walk into traffic. Yeah, yeah. For forgetting a joke. Yeah. Like Well, it's also like that all just teaches you and gets you better for the next time. But mm-hmm. it it's it's losses like that that just make you a better comic. Especially mm-hmm. coming back to it. Like you need to get kicked in the face or in the chest like that often. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've had moments like that where like I've opened up for big guys and just fucking ate a dick and you're just like ugh and you feel terrible Mm -hmm. you fucking feel disgusting like it's just this malaise that's on you and then either the next set's better or you work harder to where like that how i don't i don't think anyone has a better set than the set after you fucking tank yeah because you're just like you're just like oh my god i gotta fucking yeah yeah uh have you had any of the sets where you walked into it like, oh, this is going to be awesome, and then you just ate a bag of dicks? Oh, absolutely. One of the, I remember the, some of the first theaters I did with Joe, I just, like, that jump from, like, clubs to uh-huh. theaters and thousands of people, it was, like, it, it was such a learning curve. I think we did six shows, and I think I finally got my legs under me by the third one. Okay. Yeah, and it was just so tough, but then... You know, I can't imagine the panic that sets in when a joke doesn't work to well, thousands. It's not even that. It's a lot of um. It's it was just getting used to like the delay mm. of like saying the joke and then everyone all getting it and laughing and then just the cascade of people. I said that like the best way to describe it is like being in the batting cages, but you don't see where the ball goes after you hit it. So mm. you just you you see it coming, you hit it, and then you're just like. All right, did it hit the gate? Like, is it, where's it going? You know? Mm-hmm. And then, like, like when it is quiet in front of 5,000 people, it is quiet in front of 5,000 people. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, that's the, the thing I always play in my head that freaks me out. It's yeah, just thinking it, about having silence from that many people. It's also like, you know, when you first start doing stand-up and then you start to keep doing it, you get to the moment where you realize, like, oh, people are paying attention to me. Like, and I remember that first realization of like, oh, people are listening to what I'm saying. And you're like, oh, shit. And then you get past that and you're like, oh, now I have something to say. But just on that bigger scale, you're like, oh, there's a lot of people listening to me right now. <laughs> yeah. 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 That is a, I, I haven't done, I think the most I think I've done is six or 700. But uh, there's a theater here in town, the Scottish Rite Theater, and it's set up um, very like play traditional. So from the two steps down from the stage, it's 15 feet mm. to the first row of audience yeah, members. Yeah, yeah. And they're set up uh, like 150 here and then another 50 on a balcony, and they're pretty far away. So even though it's only 200 people, it feels huge. Mm-hmm. And the room is so wide and just massively tall, and the stage is so far back that the first time I did it, uh, I was grateful. Hunter Duncan that was running the show was like, hey, I don't know, I don't want this to come off like shitty, but if you haven't done like a room this size before, slow down a lot. Yeah. And I went out, and my first joke, I thought I was doing it slow, and I felt the delay. There's a tag, like a sec, like it's it usually gets a delayed laugh that I talk over on purpose, and it didn't come. And then I was going to talk over it, and then it came way later, and I was like, whoa, yeah, and just having that timing, and then it a minute of it was just me saying stuff and seeing what the volley was, but it I can't imagine that from. 10 times that people like that's crazy yeah, it's bananas yeah and then you see these pictures i just did the nashville comedy festival and the uh night that i got there uh nate bargazzi set the record in the bridgestone arena for doing it in the round because he took out more stage to add more seats oh so it was i think nineteen thousand three sixty five. Whoa! but just seeing the pictures of that just little bitty guy on stage and then just <sighs> lights of everyone just cascading. Like, that's wild. And you see pictures you ever, like, and then you have like, it gets to the point where it's so big you have TVs. Mm. So the people that like can't see the little guy, they can look up at the TV and yeah, see you close the, up. The, seeing that up there yeah. also, it just, it feels um, like I'm playing flag football. Yeah. And it's like, oh, there's, that's the professionals. That's yeah. the actual sport. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Very humbling. Yeah. No kidding. Uh, so you've uh, come to Austin a couple times now. How do you feel about it? Uh, I love it, man. It's <clears throat> it's different. I was saying in the car, it feels like uh, when I was first starting comedy, when um, 
But I just didn't get as many spots. It was like you stay out late, you do all these shows, then you get home at like three, four in the morning, and then you fucking wake up at noon, uh, you know, one, and then you do it all over again. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's fun, man. I mean, I've gotten more spots here in the past four days than I've ever gotten in Los Angeles. I mean, I did four last night. I think I'm doing three tonight. You know, it's not a night where you're doing less than two. Yeah. It's crazy. And But it's also fun because you get to like... I came in with like a few things I was trying to work on and I got to watch it build and just get better and have more confidence with it. Mm -hmm. So you go back to Los Angeles and then you can really like, you know, do shit. And yeah. You can show them. It's now like a bit that's new and in because LA, it's like you're always trying to impress people. You want to do your best stuff. It's hard to like write and like grow as a comic there just because like there's so much pressure. You never know who's going to be in the audience. You know yeah. what I mean? You want Quentin Tarantino to see Bomb. Yeah. Yeah. Tonight you're working out material and you know, all of the famouses are out. Yeah. It's like, ah, oh, fuck. You know? Yeah. yeah I, I imagine that's it's got to be cool to come here like a workout room. I know a lot of people, I've, I've not had a chance to go and do New York that way, but I've always heard that. that you know, being able to do six, seven in a night, that just the ability to develop material heightens. And I feel like we definitely have that here. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, there's so many spots, and it's all within walking distance. Yeah, it's man. It's crazy. I went to Sunset, Mothership, Creek, then back to Mothership. Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a wild place to be. Yeah, I, I love it. Um, do you feel like the old scene is combating with, like, the new scene? Um, there so there was definitely at first, especially 2020, there also was this thing, because Austin has always been a blue dot in a red state, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the arts community are usually a more extreme reflection of the population. So we had some very uh, wear a mask, stay at home, you're killing my grandmother types that were in the scene that just refused to come out for any reason. And then the people that were here and moving here and a bunch of people starting it during the pandemic, which blew my mind, that you'd be like, the world's yeah. ending. I should start comedy. Yeah. <laughs> Fucking okay. But they started doing pop-up shows at bars and stuff. Uh, and so there was you know, a small handful of the old scene that they're comics. They want to go do comedy. So that created a riff. And then with new venues opening and doing big stuff, and now there's kind of a bitterness Cap City shutting down. Also, that was their you know crown jewel, and that was where everybody got their big credits was through there. So there was some animosity that built up, and then basically the people from the old scene that decided we we don't care, we just want to be a part of the comedy community did that, and they've come out and they've integrated themselves, and they're cool and they're a part of it. But then there's you know some of the old ones that are people that were staples of the scene that I haven't seen on a stage and. Two years. Jesus. And it's just like, that's crazy to me. Because mm -hmm. it's no one from the new scene was ever like, fuck you old Austin people. It was like, hey, come do spots. And just the that like crabs in a bucket thing. Or it was just like, well, no, we're not going to do that. We're not part yeah. of that. And then they did it for so long that suddenly there's a whole new 200 comics here that they don't know. And 50 of them are good. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, those spots that you used to have five, six times a week are... They're full yeah. for a while. Because you and, haven't been doing stand-up in two years. Yeah. And, like, even if you got back up there, like, you're going to suck for a minute. Mm -hmm. And now you got to go do open mics, and you're an eight-year comic that's opened for, you know, some big names, and you can't even get a spot on local shows? That's got to <sighs> suck. Yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah, it's a terrible feeling, I'm sure. But, uh, I mean, there, there's also this new uh, kind of click set that's arising with Mothership opening. Because mm -hmm. that went from... There were all of these shows that were pretty steadily uh, set on a weekly basis. Like, these were your Monday shows, Tuesday, Wednesday, et cetera. And then 80% of the showrunners got hired as door guys. So then now they're doing that. And then you have uh, Sunset opening up, Kingdom opening up. And then so now all the shows that were at Creek and were at Vulcan are moved around. Vulcan loses a bunch of stuff because Kill Tony leaves. So now it's like the people that were there and were working as door guys in kind of like a flapper sense mm -hmm. where they weren't the store caliber, but they were working to get spots. You know, like now they're, they've got a midnight show maybe mm -hmm. that's got 30 people at it. So it went from uh, very accessible for a lot of people to now like the best shows. You've got to like really work for the spots again. And then because of the, the exclusivity of mothership, just being able to get up and go there, like that changes people standing in the comedy scene immediately. Yeah, you go and do one set on the open mic, 
and then Adam says something to you, suddenly you're booked on every show. Hmm. It's wild. Yeah. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm very. I feel very lucky to be able to sh- show up and walk into the mothership. Yeah. Because I've seen people get turned away, and I'm like, oh damn, that's wild. Yeah. But I like that. I mm-hmm. like that. That's a thing because like the store doesn't have that as much anymore. I mean, there was nothing crazy. That was the thing that I think I hated the most was like being in the back, especially as an employee, and you see people who's like, you don't work here. What do you, you know? You, mm-hmm. Just because you love Applebee's doesn't mean you walk into the kitchen. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. So I like how exclusive it is and how hard it is to get into. I do wish that there was. Because, uh, like, at the store, there was the sacred ground in the back where mm-hmm. you could go and be away from the people. Yeah. But there was also the patio yeah. where the people like me could go and hang with my friends. And then I'd run into somebody that I knew on the show or it was working that night. And you could ha- catch up, say hey, and talk to the bartender, which you can kind of do at Mitzi's, but then they kick you out at 10. Yeah. And it's like, well, that was when, like, the cool part started. Yeah. Right? And yeah. so, like, uh, I've gotten to hang a, a handful of times uh, when I've done roast battles there and stuff, but... Uh, like the last roast battle I did there, I g- get done with my battle. I watched the last battle, and then uh, me and the guys from the last battle went down to Mitzi's to go get another drink. And they're like, "Sorry, you guys got to go. It's, it's you know paid regulars and late night crew only." And we're like, "But I I was just on the stage." <laughs> <laughs> so like you don't have the wristband, dog. Yeah, like, I'm yeah I had the pink wristband, not the black wristband. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. Come on, I'm like oh no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but it is uh, interesting to see what that. It's also blown some people's heads up huge. Yeah, it's just kind of cool to see. Yeah, it's just fun to watch. Yeah, because it, it'll pop. You know, it's like, oh yeah. yeah, and when it does, it's always great. Yeah, and it's like they're still the homie. Like, yeah, of you know, course. Like we still love you. Just like right. chill. A little He's bit. like, hey man, come down. Yeah, come on, come on. You're not God's gift to Earth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, and you see a lot of that in L.A. There's a few comics who, you know, they start to get a little th- something, and then they like get really big headed. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes shit changes for them, you know? Yeah. It's uh, it's also cool. That, like, we also don't have as much industry here. Mm. So, like, there's not uh, a ton of people that are going. Like, Casey Shornima went and then went from doing spots here and is on JFL and is now writing on, you know, Saturday Night Live. Like, yeah, that's a pretty cool uh, trajectory. But And then you've got Hans that went from living in a van to touring with Rogan. But outside of that, like most of the people, like the best thing they hope for is just doing really good spots in town. There's not yeah. like some, oh, if I do this, I might get a movie deal or a TV yeah. show or any of that. The the scene doesn't have the maturity for that yet. Like we don't have a bunch of ten year comics. We have a shit ton between four and eight. Mm. So that's uh, in like five years, Austin's gonna be fucking crazy yeah that was the one thing i was watching the mothership and seeing all the door guys and everything and all the spots they're getting and how much they get up and and who got picked and everything it's like in five years like they, it does feel like they're on a fast track compared to the store system i think in five years like it's going to be insane there's going to be a lot of beasts coming out of austin yeah and, and it is going to be interesting to see how what comes out of la because you know they hired new people and you know see what especially at the store it is the store is what you make out of it, right? There's a lot of people I've seen get hired there and they just don't go anywhere or they never get passed or they just don't know what the next step is. And it's like, you know, write, get better, you know, all that jazz. Whereas like in Austin, they get a couple spots a week. They also get paid for them. And then they get thrown up randomly on the cold opens too. Mm-hmm. So it's like, if you if that's your life for the next year of like a couple spots and the book shows you get, you're like, yeah, you're on stage all the time. Mm-hmm. It was, it's like every time you get on stage, you're a little bit better. And what is that, 10,000 hours? Yeah. They are getting so much time. And that's it like rules. so important. Well, and the getting to watch mm-hmm. so many great people. I mean, just sitting for a crew show and watching all the people that pop in. And I mean, if you're a storytelling comic, getting to watch Ron White. Oh, so good. <laughs> that's <clears throat> fucking bonkers. I mean, he popped in the other night and it was like so wild to watch him watch him do stand up because I, I I used to see him at the store all the time and I I mean I've always been I mean I was a big fan of the blue collar comedy tour. Yeah. So and then especially Ron White. So then watching him break off and do his own thing and then realize how much of a great comic he is. Yeah. Compared to those guys. You're just yeah. like, oh yeah, you know? Yeah. It uh I grew up my whole family would take turns telling the tater salad story. That tater salad joke was so funny. And like then there is a night here where Bert Kreischer's on stage and people are yelling the machine and then he says I'm not going to tell the machine story unless Ron White tells Tater Salad 
the crowd doesn't even know he's there. And then Ron White comes out and tells fucking Tater Sal. Ah, and it's like, ah, what? That's so what? good. <laughs> yeah. I remember, uh, well, actually, one of my favorite Ron White moments is, um, so I get past at the store, and it's like my first set as a paid regular. Uh, like on the lineup booked and everything. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, I, you know, I'm in the mix with everybody. We're hanging out and uh, we're in the back bar at the store. And, uh, you know, I, he was like, how was your first set? I was like, it was great. You know, it feels great to be paid regularly. And he comes, he grabs me by the head and he kisses me on both cheeks. And he's just like, you're a made man now. Like you would in the mafia. Yeah. And I was like, at like, I was just like, that was great. Like it made me feel so fucking cool. Yeah. Cause like, you know, a lot of it is, it's like that whole imposter syndrome that I think every comic has where you're like, am I supposed to be here? Am I doing the right thing? Am I funny? Blah, blah, blah. And then like to have those guys like validate you and tell you you're good. You're just like, oh, okay. Like this is now the work begins. Yeah. That's, uh, I was watching, uh, Louis CK and Theo Vaughn on a podcast and Louis has no idea who Theo is. So funny. At all. Yeah. He's never even heard of him. So he's asking him like, well, how long have you been doing it? <laughs> and, and Theo's like, 15, 17 years. And he's like, that's good. You're still young. And it's like, just hearing that shit, you're like, oh, fuck. Yeah. And then yeah. the way they're talking about it, I was like, yeah, I really feel like my career is just getting started. Yeah. Like, this is where I'm getting into the meat of it. And I was like, whoa. That's the perspective on that. But like, yeah, that imposter syndrome is very real. Yeah. That was the, f- the first thing Tony told me when I got past was he was like, he was like, it doesn't get any easier after this. Now it just gets harder. He was like, you did, you know, three or two years getting into the store to get the job and then six years to get passed. He was like, now you got to write. And now, now, now the rest of the, now it's, you just graduated college. And now you got to fucking find a job. You know what I mean? Now yeah. you got to put that degree to work. So yeah, it, it is very interesting to see how it all plays out. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, it's also weird because there's no, uh, like, correct path. No, there's no direction. We're all just kind of sailing blindly in the fucking night. Everyone's just yeah. fucking guessing. And yeah. it's like, well, maybe I should just throw everything on Instagram, and perhaps I will go viral with one yeah. and then sell tickets. It's like, oh, yeah, but then all of my jokes are on Instagram. Yeah, so and then like, all those people show up to your shows, and they just want you to do Q&A. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, like, tough. The, the audience. Like, I never wanted to do q and I'm the, a comedian. The audience you bring is so important. I remember Eric Griffin was telling me um, – he was out doing because he does TV stuff, right? Mm-hmm. And he's a great actor. Mm-hmm. But he was saying how like sometimes that doesn't translate. And then I remember like he started doing his podcast and everything, and everything started blowing up. Now he's like selling out all the time. Um, but I remember he was saying that um, he was on on stage, and all of his college like there was a lot of college kids because you know he was Montez, right? Yeah. And then there's like this group of old people in the front. And he starts ragging on him. He was just like, you know, you guys probably don't even know what the fuck I do. Like, what did you guys just get, like, free tickets, blah, blah, And they're like, no, we really like you, and I'm dying up here. And he was like, oh, fuck. He was yeah. like, I'm so sorry. Because I'm dying up here is like, that's geared to people who grew up in the 70s and the yeah. 60s who love that shit. Like, my dad, my grandfather, they loved it yeah. because that was their shit. So, like, now he's got those people coming out to shows. And then it was just like, oh, yeah, Whoa. what you do does bring in a certain kind of demographic. Yeah, I... Uh I think that's it's cool to see because I see a lot of people. Uh, you'll see their social media presence, and then you see them come in and do the spots like here and because he's like uh, Che Durena. Mm-hmm. He's fucking hilarious, but like all of his Instagram stuff is just like super hot thirst traps, mm-hmm. and then him pumping up and saying something funny about it. Yeah, yeah, you can't do that for an hour. Yeah, and so but then you see him do his jokes, and he does a lot of crowd work and talks to a lot of people, but his crowd, it. I was like, oh, maybe it'll be a lot of really hot chicks. It's a lot of very horny dudes. Yeah. It's a lot of very horny dudes. Exactly. And that is like what he brought out. And it's like, whoa. Yeah. Uh, was, uh, uh, fr- uh, I'm trying to do this as vague as possible. Uh, a friend of mine uh, who's doing well, sells out a lot of shows, does a character uh, making fun of a group of people that they don't like. Mm-hmm. And then that group of people loves the character. So they all go to the shows and sell out. But now they shake the hands of everyone they're making fun of and people they don't like. Oh. But it's like you're selling out shows. Oh, God, that's got to feel weird. It's also like, I don't know, man. It's like, you know, people just Does want. Does that person drink? 
No. Uh, okay. Yeah, because if that person drank, that's coming to a head quickly. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's also like it is. It is what you, you know. It is what you want. Some people just want to be. They want to be able to pay their bills. Uh, some people want to be absolutely famous. Some people just want to be the best comics they can be. And like for me, at the end of the day, it's like that's just what I want to do. I just want to be the best comic I can be. At the end of the day. Yeah. Also, my wife makes all the money. So <laughs> no, uh, no. But yeah, it is. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. It's it's just what you want. You know. Yeah. Not all sold out on audiences are the best. For sure. I met a guy in Canyon Lake. I got booked to do this show at like a country club thing there. There was golf cart parking. Like that was the type of venue. And I went up first, or the host went up first, and then I went up uh, and I just ate a bag of dicks. And it was confusing because it looked like it should be my crowd. It felt like it should have been good. And then just everything was just falling on deaf ears. And it just confused me so much. And then the guy that went after me, uh, he is murdering hard. He's a uh, like, dude in his 40s with a lot of family-friendly material. And then at the very end, he makes a turn and makes a Trump joke uh, at Trump's expense to this crowd. And they suddenly turn on him and hate him so much. And he turns over and winks at me after he does it. <laughs> and then he gets off stage. And so he comes back to like the little side green room and he goes, yeah, those people fucking suck. But, but also like you can still kill to idiots. And I was like, oh man, that's yeah. like a cool lesson. And then the headlighter goes up and he brings the fucking house down. His closer is a like, uh, it's Krispy Kreme, come and carry me home. It's like a song. Yeah, yeah. And the crowd sings it. It's deafening. And after the show, like, yeah, I'm upset. I bombed. And he came up afterwards and he was like, listen, man, clean is green. If you want to make a living doing this job, you need to stop being so filthy with your words. This year, I made $100,000 doing comedy. And I, I asked him, I was like, how long have you been doing it? And he's like, 35 years. And I was like, if I make 100 grand, 35 years in a comedy, I'll put a gun in my mouth. Like, yeah. That's, what? Bro, same thing, bro. I, what? All those people, the same thing, that's what Christina heard, that's what Segura heard, that's what all those guys heard, you know what I mean? Even when coming up, I mean, people were like, you know, you can't do it this way, you should do it this way. And then I think this past couple years, especially this last year, has been the one time that I feel like I've finally been writing for myself. Like, Hell I've finally yeah. been writing stuff that I like, that I find funny, that I'm like, oh, this is what I would want to see. Mm -hmm. And once you get to that point, I feel like your comedy just gets better. Especially, it's like, hey, man, if you don't want to be a clean comic, don't be a clean comic. You know what I mean? Like, Patrice said it the best. He was like, audiences should be 50% hating you and 50% loving you. Mm -hmm. You know, no one should love you 100%. Because, you know, what are you, fucking... Everybody's best friend, like you know, it's just like just do the jokes that you that make you laugh. Yeah, I really like that. I think that's um, for the first couple of years. I was so uh, I had an idea of what I was doing on stage was seeing if they also thought it was funny. Yeah, that was the mindset I carried. Like here, are these things I wrote. I hope you also enjoy them. No, no. Now it's like I think this is funny. Yeah. What? It, well, it's, now it's like I think this is funny. I'm gonna tell you. And for a while, then it was still like, I hope you agree. And now it's gotten to a place where like, no, no, no this is funny. You're going to laugh. Yeah, yeah. And, and that feels like such a different, uh, if I was doing a set before and there was silence that because it was a small crowd or just not working, I would start sweating so profusely and panicking and just pulling the rip cord and doing, you know, like, oh, here's a joke that always works. And then it's, it doesn't because it's the the mood is off and I yeah, panic yeah. and now there's no panic because it's like oh no I have so much more funny things to say yeah. why aren't you laughing let's figure this out and then we'll move on yeah, we'll and figure that, out who you guys are as a crowd yeah and that that mindset shift has changed how I feel on stage so much mm -hmm. um, I I know that that that's the other part too it's like I can't wait to see what the next one is yeah like the next thing I figure out. Yeah, uh, Tony says it best. He's like, you're only as good as your last joke. And that's mm. what I try to keep in mind all the time when I'm writing. It's like, all right, how do I get better? How do I get better? Because it is tough, especially as a comic in L.A., and you see the, the rigmarole of everything, and you're like, oh, am I good? Is Why is this person? Blah, blah, blah. And you're like, no, you just focus on what's in front of you. And the better you get, like, I mean, at this point, like, I would... I used to stress so much about not getting JFL. Mm -hmm. And, like, now that I've gotten, like, two auditions, I'm just kind of like... Well, now if I get it, it's the least coolest thing I've done. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I've done so much other shit. And then it gets to a point where you're like, oh, I really don't 
it, it doesn't mean as much as I thought it used to, right? Because I'm doing everything. I'm at the mothership. You're, at, you know, I'm paid regular at the store. It's like, yeah, I don't have to do this anymore. You know what yeah. I mean? I can just do the comedy I'm doing. And yeah. then it also makes it look bad on them, where you're just like, diversity is a big thing, but like the kid that did everything, you know what I mean? It's like, you haven't booked them. It's like, that's on you guys. Yeah, you guys yeah. fucked up. Yeah. That's interesting. Um, so you said like one of the big shifts for you has been writing the jokes for you. Yeah. Like jokes that I think are funny. Yeah. Do you have like a process? Um, usually it's talking to my wife. Yeah. Yeah. I, like I'll just talk to my wife and then I'll say some ridiculous shit or I'll be sitting down and I'll think of it. I'm such an ADD person. Like uh -huh. I either have to be doing chores or like something just with my hands that I'm like distracted. It's something that makes me daydream. Yeah. And then that's when it starts to come to me. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, it's so tough for me to sit down and, like, write. But when I do have, like, prompts or things I've thought of through the day, like, I can sit down and I can flesh those out a lot easier than being like, all right, I'm going to write a joke. It's like I have to have things that, like, inspire me. Yeah. I, I've i always uh, – there's so many people in the scene that are very, uh, like, studious where they'll go to a coffee shop and they'll all meet up and they'll sit down and write. And it's like my brain doesn't do that at all. I got to be on, like, a road trip with like a boring science podcast and then my brain goes into la la land and then I come back with like a whole new premise. It's like, oh, we'll work that out. But yeah, I, I it's interesting because everybody has like a different process. Yeah. Uh, but I, I feel like uh, the best people's process is just like, I just kind of think of stuff and then I, then I do it. <laughs> yeah, that's the toughest thing is thinking of it and then doing it because a lot of people think of it put it to the side and especially me like i'll put it to the side and be like ah now it's not funny or like whatever and then i'll finally whip it out or try it on stage and it'll get a laugh and i'm like why didn't i do this sooner yeah, yeah, yeah. i've been sitting on this yeah uh my evernote has so many of those things just a little i have a note in there yeah. and i just add stuff to it and then that it is nice that we have so many mics in town too because yeah. you can practice it on shows but then there's you know 25 mics a week you can just pop in yeah. if you've got three minutes that you want to work out and it I mean, you can, it's, you don't have to wait. Yeah. <laughs> That's the other nice yeah. part. You're like, Hey, put me up next. Yeah. And you're like, okay. Huh. That's so great. I, I hope, I hope your audience didn't mind. We just talked about comedy straight for, Oh no, 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 they get it. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. Cool, yeah, cool. yeah. They're, uh, they're like comedy fans. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, the, most of these podcasts are literally just me getting really high with a comic and then just asking Sweet. comedy stuff. Oh, sick, 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 um, sick, sick. I do want to bring up this thing though. Did you see the, uh, the girl or the trans lady who uh, blew the DoorDash driver and filmed it, but no. didn't tell him that he was trans. What? Or didn't? Yeah. What? Yeah, it was pretty great. No way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Say more things. Uh, no, it Let's was just discuss. so. Yeah, yeah. So it was. It was so a uh, trans woman. Trans woman with an OnlyFans. Yes. Orders DoorDash. Okay. Says that she was like, "Oh damn, this guy's hot." Video recording herself. So I was like, "Oh, this guy's hot." I'm, I'm gonna see if I can suck his dick. And then like, opens the door, drops all the food, and the guy's like, "Hey, damn girl, you know you're fine." And he was like, "Hey, what's up? You know, calm down. You're about to get your dick sucked." And he was like, "For real?" She was like, "Yeah, come on in." And he was like, "All right." So he consents. Yeah. Goes in, and then she's like, "Do you mind if I film?" And he's like, "Nah, that's fine." And then she blows him on, and then like, I guess put it on her OnlyFans. Whoa. And he and like people were like, "That's fucked up." But I was like, "Listen, man." If you get caught by a penis flytrap, that's on you. You know what I mean? Yeah, I still I feel like there's got to be some disclosure. Uh, I, I it's it's one of those things that like eyes. It's like, but I guess if you couldn't tell it, it didn't. Yeah, matter. man. Well, also like I watched the video, pretty deep voice. So it's like you know if there's there's red flags. You know what I mean? Like if so you're he not was just in denial. I don't know if he was in denial, but it's also one of those things that like and like. If that's what you know what I mean, like if you're attracted to it off bat, that's you know what I mean. They got you. Yeah. That's you know. Yeah, that's crazy. I think it's uh, Louis has that joke about like how every guy is just afraid they're a pedophile. Hilarious. Where it's it's because it would be the worst thing to find. I was like, oh no, and like I think a lot of us got called gay so much that like they're like, oh, what if I'm gay? Yeah. And then, like you like that is the the fear is that like they'll hook up with yeah, a yeah. trans woman and they'll be like. I'm gay and I like it. Oh, yeah. no. Well, I mean, that's why most of them get killed is because dudes yeah. freak the fuck out when it's like, nah, man, be a man. Suck a dick. You know what I mean? You got, <laughs> you got, got. <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? You got, you, it's just, it's fucking, you know? Man, suck a dick. You got, got. You know what I mean? You got, got. Now you got to suck them. You know what I mean? That's on you. You know? What are you going to be rude? Yeah. I mean, come on. It's just so funny. She's got blue balls. Yeah. I mean, you know what I mean? Eat the pussy, dog. Shaped like a dick. 
Oh man, that is. Uh, well, you heard uh, Ron White's story about it, right? Um, maybe. He's got a fucking great bit. He told it on Rogan, and then I think he ended up. It, it was uh, I don't know if he put it on a special yet, but he'll do it on stage. And it was about how um, when he was in the military, there was this place in Hawaii where you could go and you can get sucked off for like a couple bucks. And he said he'd go there every weekend, right, all the time. And then he said he was on the road watching a documentary about these lady boys in Hawaii who have a part of the island where they go and they do their sex trafficking or do their sex trade. And he was like, that's the place I went. You know what I mean? And that's like how he found out he was getting, he was like, oh shit, I used to get blown by dudes all the time. And it was just so fucking funny. Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah. His stories are so wild. That one about the fucking drive-in movie theater, the porn theater. Oh yeah, the everyone on blades. skates, dude. So fucking funny. It it's just one of those ones where I, every time I hear it, I'm just laughing so hard. It's like, yeah. nope, what? And the visual of just yeah. a bunch of children jerking off in roller yeah. skates. And there's the idea of him being like, uh, him being like, uh, he was just like, come on, Ron, we gotta go. And he's like, uh, they didn't know I was here. Yeah, you could have just, yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> just hiding in the bushes, yeah. that fucking rules. Um, have you uh, seen any like comedy Porn? recently? Yeah. Oh. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I would hope so. Oh, yeah. Do you have a favorite porn site? Um, I mean, Pornhub X video is always great, but um, World Star Hip Hop is my new favorite porn site because they just they just promote OnlyFans chicks all the time, and it's like wild. Ridiculous. And you pay for OnlyFans? No, I don't. Of course not. I just I oh what? <laughs> I mean, I mean or what, whatever ways people would do that. Like, crazy! I can't believe someone would say that. Uh, uh, they uh, <laughs> I have a bit about it, but they there was uh, there's. Two little people with on, with OnlyFans. Oh, Erica Cal or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels weird. I can't be. I. It's so funny because it's like you have to say little people because you couldn't be like when well, you're not supposed to say midgets, but also you can't be like uh, little girls because it just seems even weird. But they're like little women, right? But then it sounds like you're talking about a play. Like it's yeah. a whole thing. But uh, <laughs> that is funny. I would ask people. I was like, "Would you have sex with a little person?" I, I mean, those the if I'm thinking of the same ones you're thinking of, yeah, 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 yeah. they're hot, yeah. And then uh, I, I, so when I'm on stage, but it would be weird. I mean, maybe I asked women if they'd fuck a little guy, and they were like, nah. and then I'd be like, what if it was the guy from Game of Thrones? And they're like, oh yeah. And it's like, all right, so Dinklage, yeah, they're banging Dinklage, of course. Whoa, good looking dude, is he? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously he's on so I, much I guess, stuff. Well, here's the thing, he's ruined for me. Have you seen Tiptoes? No. What's Tiptoes? Oh, buddy. You owe this to yourself. Get high and watch Tiptoes. Okay. It is an early 2000s film that somehow snuck under the radar. So the plot, Matthew McConaughey, Kate Beckinsale, they're uh, a couple. Uh, he is a firefighter in Malibu. She is a painter. They have an apartment. Uh, she gets pregnant. Matthew McConaughey is freaked out about it, so he buries himself in work in Malibu. One day while he's at work, his twin brother shows up, played by Gary Oldman. But his twin brother is a little person. In fact, his whole family and everyone else that he's related to is a little person. Matthew McConaughey is the only regular sized one. So now Kate Beckinsale is freaked out that her baby's gonna be a little person. And she's being counseled. Bridget the Midget, the little person porn star is in it. Peter Dinklage plays one of uh, Gary Oldman's uh, motorcycle gang members. His girlfriend is Patricia Arquette. Oh, my God. He has a French accent for some reason, and he walks around with a jug of cognac and morphine. And he goes, oh, you think we are so cute and cuddly? That is a Peter Oh, my God. Ride. I have to see this. At one point when Matthew brings Kate to uh, meet his family, there's a huge party, and there's 100-plus little people there of every different shape, size, and flavor, but all very small. They walk in. And she goes, geez, you could have told me your whole family was midgets. And he goes, they're not midgets, Carol. They're dwarves. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Did you see it? was uh, at Sundance. It was meant as a drama. I have to watch this. Did you see, uh, did you ever see him in, uh, was it, uh, was it Death at a Funeral? Or it was originally a, um, I think it was originally a British movie. And then it they did an American version with Chris Rock. But oh. Peter Dinklage plays the uh, dad's secret lover. So like he shows up and he like uh, blackmails the family where he's just like you know oh, give me yeah, money, yeah, give yeah, me yeah, money yeah. these pictures are gonna come out and it's so funny because it's Peter Dinklage in both movies and oh. it's just hilarious. He's like what do you do? He's like I used to fuck your dad and it's so funny. Oh that rules. Yeah I just I couldn't take him seriously. Just like digging a girl out. 
Yeah, I mean, come on. Yeah, it's so good. I, j- <laughs> I would want to watch it. I would want to <laughs> watch him try his best. <laughs> you know, because he's going to smack the ass and it's going to look like one of those little Barbie hands. That's <laughs> like, so funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I remember. Uh, yeah, no, it just apparently. Apparently they get a lot of ass. That's also there was a, a friend of uh, Brad Williams. Yeah, uh, and then also Nick and Vicky. There's two uh, little people who do stand up that I've met uh, at the store. Good friends of mine. Mm-hmm. But they're telling me so they have like conventions where they all get together and they meet and stuff. But they're telling me that um, I bet that's an orgy. Oh, dude, it's crazy. Mervis got to go to a, like one of the parties once because they're all doing a show and they got to go and he said it was like. I went to the place and it was only there was only them allowed and then what their guests and so they got to go in and he was like it was like a sea of just little people just bumping and grinding getting crazy dude he was like it was little bitches everywhere dog it was just thoughts dog I just want you to picture this you and I are standing fifty yards away from each other and there's a sea of little people just fucking just going grinding. crazy like and Mardi then Gras catch with a football <laughs> 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 we're just tossing it. But I guess so. There's different kinds of um, uh, little people. So there's yeah. like there's like the proportional ones, then there's the like dwar- yeah. yeah. But I guess the ones that are fully proportional, those are the ones that are like the Brad Pitts of yeah, the little yeah, yeah, people. Yeah. And they they can have the pick of any like chicks. So those are the like Vern Troyer types. Mm-hmm. No, no. Is he, which Vern one is Troyer? He? I think still had um, baby arms. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> well, so like growing up. Uh, and it sucks. This is. I think this has come up on the show like eight times. But there used to be dwarves and midgets were like taxonomy. They weren't like slurs. Yeah. So like Peter Dinklage was a midget and Vern Troyer was a dwarf. Yes. And that was. And it was just like a medical thing. That was mm-hmm. what that thing was. Yeah. And then uh, they. Sw- then the words age. And out. then everybody got angry at all of the words. And then they're little people. But they're like. It's because then there's also a bunch of the other ones too. Yeah. There's a bunch of other ways that you can be small, uh, and they have the surgeries now are wild. Oh, what they so uh, just because we've gotten so much better at surgery and all the like 3D printing technology, uh, a lot of the people with achondroplasia where they have the kind of legs that bow out, they can take them and then break them and extend them. And they gain like a foot and a half Holy shit. of height, and their proportions start to look more normal because everything isn't all, you know, kind of bunched up. It's crazy. Damn. Yeah, that's wild. But I mean, it. Uh, everybody that I've like read the stories of is extremely painful. I mean, yeah, you're getting you're breaking bones, you're got cutting shit up, but then it's like, you know. Yeah, but now you're like almost normal. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I saw a, a proportional. I mean, the first like proportional lady I'd ever saw was at a, a I was at a like a rock show. I think I was like seventeen, mm-hmm. and this girl she was maybe like four foot four, like mm-hmm. small, mm-hmm. but she looked like a twenty six year old woman. Mm-hmm. Huge cans, just like, but just sm- like like they just shrunk her down. Wow, it was wild. It was just like holy shit, and it was just it was crazy. My yeah. cousin can't. My cousin lived in Modesto, and I guess he'd never ever seen like a little person. Uh-huh. And uh, he came to the store, and I had to like t- I had to like take him away because uh, my friend, who's a little person, pulled up in a car, and he immediately started laughing, <laughs> yeah. like uncontrollably, <laughs> well. like couldn't <laughs> couldn't contain himself. Like he was like he was like he's driving a car. <laughs> He's like, he hopped out. Like, he was on the floor. He was just like, I can't. He's so small. And, like, we walked in the other room, and I was like, dude, you got to chill. And he's like, fine. And we're sitting there, and he's like, couldn't yeah. stop laughing. And then he's, and we're walking past the hall, and he sees him, and then he just starts dying laughing again. I'm like, dude, you got to stop. Yeah. He's like, I've never seen. I can't. I don't know why. Yeah, it's, I mean, I get it. There's those times when I'm not supposed to laugh at something. It's the funniest thing in the world to me. Uh, I, I went to a funeral uh, not too long ago, and there was, the priest was deaf. <laughs> and so it's, you know, it's an interment. So it's this very emotional thing. But I'm in rural Tennessee. And so, <laughs> and everybody else is like, and like me and like two other family members. Everyone's like, <laughs> yeah, like, stop, stop. And he's he's like, like, come on. No, don't look at me. Don't look at me. I will start laughing. He won't hear it, but I will start laughing. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, those situations are the worst. Yeah. Uh, well, shit, man. Thank you so much for coming on today. Dude, my uh, pleasure. 
Uh, is there anything you want to plug? Or uh, I got a podcast called Peaked on YouTube. Uh, we smoke hash and then we talk uh, comedy and shit. Um, and then yeah, just follow me on Instagram, Frank Castillo. I mean, I'm gonna be back and forth between Austin, so yeah, Fuck I'm excited. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on, man. Dude, thank it's you so much. I'm excited to be here. Thank you guys. Uh, it's been highly social. See you next week. <laughs>